a seminal work that many people love to quote, but probably haven't read. Welcome everyone to another round of the Mere Mortals book reviews. My name is Karen, and I like to do these book reviews for those who want to transcend beyond their own mere mortality to learn more about the books they're reading, to dive deep into some fascinating subject matters. Today, I have a quite thick book, a quite heavy book that's hard to read. It is Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. Now, this book was published in 1651, so it's got quite a few centuries on it and it's 567 pages in total uh, and that's not including some of the uh, descriptions the introductions and things like that that uh, appear in the the front of the book now this is a treatise on human nature government religion and how they all mingle it's split up into four parts which i will read out to you now and the first of these parts is of man the second is of commonwealth the third of a christian commonwealth and the fourth is of the kingdom of darkness so in the first part he's really laying out his structure on what is a man what is a person why uh how, how can we define them and you know he lists sort of a bunch of the emotions and how man is in their in their sort of human nature the second is of commonwealth so this is talking about governments how uh, a government can respond to its citizens, the different types of governments that there are, what are the responsibilities of a government, things like that. The third is uh, of a Christian commonwealth. So that is talking about how the religion of Christianity plays in with religion and how these two mix, how this should uh, give guideposts, I guess, of, of what the commonwealth should behave and do and things like that. And then the fourth one is of how commonwealths can go wrong what are some of the philosophical philosophical traits that some governments have that might be wrong and um, where the christianity can go wrong as well so it's sort of a book that examines quite a lot of parts and i said a treatise in particular because this really is him defining certain aspects and really trying to flesh them out starting from a base point and then going from there onwards and onwards so the basic argument of the book is that human uh, emotions and our individual rights inevitably lead to war so if you just leave humans on their own ungoverned they're going to lead to violence and to war and so therefore we need a government to tamper this outcome and this is how this government might beh behave and form and why we need this i'm going to jump onto the author in the the book now and it's definitely a treatise because of the f definitions and formal explanations. I already sort of said that. So he's very particular. So in, in certain aspects, he will be saying things like, okay, the right of nature. And um, you, it'll be hard to see on the video if you're watching there, but he bold uh, and capitalizes certain aspects where he's defining something. So this is what the right of nature is. This is what liberty means. This is what uh, the human emotion of pride means. How does this form? So is very, very particular of writing these out and fully fleshing them out. So there's no, I guess, indecision or uncertainty about what he's particularly talking about. The other influence that this book really had was on him, the, the author Thomas Hobbes, was uh, the civil war that was raging in England at the time of writing. And so you sort of get the feeling that he was maybe writing for certain individuals in particular. So this might be for the sovereign, the the king of the time. This might be for the parliament. There was, you know, some people hated him because of how he wrote the book, which seemed to indicate that the king should have more favor. Others because the the commonwealth, the government, the democracy should have more. It's a better way to, to govern people. I didn't particularly get either of that out of that, but it is noted in the introduction. And this is definitely one of those books where I would say give the introduction a read because as you start getting into the book, it's it's going to be hard to read and you'll probably want that little bit of base layer of, okay, this is what he was talking about. So even though I'm not a fan generally of, of reading the introduction before diving into the material, I think this is a, a book, one of the exceptions where I would I would suggest it's a good idea to do that. So there was a, one theme that really came out of this book for me, and that was the commonwealths, why we need political communities for the common good. And that is sort of tying in with the, the title of the book, which I'll get onto in a second. 
he always has these starting point assertions. So I think we'll examine some of them and, and then we'll get into why um, he, he really talks about Commonwealth a lot. So the some of the, the starting points that he really starts with is the indi- individual right to protect oneself. So a person has the individual right to uh, defend their land, defend their person, to use violence when necessary. And that is just one of his core points. He brings it up multiple, multiple times in the book and in different sections as well. So it's definitely one of his his starting points. Another is that we have many uh, emotions and these can be good and bad. And he goes into exquisite detail of all of the emotions, how they occur and, and why. And that is also, I guess, a starting point. And then I would say the argument sort of goes like this. We have these two things at the start. This is sort of human nature at its most core base level. Even the good emotions uh, aren't particularly useful in certain aspects because they lead to quarrels. So emotions just in general lead to valuing different things differently to, um, you know, incorrect uh, communication, not being able to communicate properly. This leads to quarrels. Quarrels lead to enemies. Enemies lead to violence and that is uh, leading to war in general, so to large-scale violence. So that's sort of his thinking there, his logical steps of, okay, you can't just leave humans on their own because it's going to inevitably lead to war. Now, what I found sort of surprising from this book was he says war is always harmful. It's always a, a net negative outcome if you have war, which I was quite surprised by because uh, I suppose... I'm not sure how this sentiment pervades nowadays. I at least feel like it's it's somewhat per- per- pervasive, which is war can have good outcomes, that it can have some positive aspects. Uh, you know, it can lead to more innovation, perhaps. It can lead to, you know, stronger formation of bonds between men who are out there. It can lead to, you know, uh, an increased appreciation of your own country because blah, 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 blah. Uh, it can you know, lead to obvious economic gains if you take over another country, things like that. And uh, I, I personally have a very strong ethical qualms against violence and war. And so I'm more on, on his side in, in terms of this. But uh, I, yeah, I, I just found that an interesting point to note in there, which was another core precept that he has is war is always bad. It always leads to violence. From then he goes on to Commonwealth. Okay, so how can we stop war from happening? You need a commonwealth. And what I found interesting about this was how this might be quite different from what we see nowadays as what a, a good commonwealth or a government ha- uh, is and how, how they should beha- uh, behave. And so for the one thing that he really comes up with is the, the fear of punishment is sort of how commonwealths work and whether that be um, through mostly the monopoly of violence. So, when you are an individual, you have this right to protect yourself. But when you uh, acquiesce to being under a, a commonwealth, this is when you give up that right and that sort of violence is now given to other people and they can behave how they want with that violence. Um, so commonwealths really only work if individuals agree to give up their rights in certain respects. So he, he argues, yes, we have these rights as a base human level with no governments, when a government steps in and you decide to be underneath that government, that's when you give up your right to violence. So it's sort of, you know, that trade-off. Would I prefer to live in a in a world without governments but where I might have, you know, more negative outcomes because I'm going to be fighting people all the time or would I re- rather be on underneath a government where I have some certain rights restricted? So, yeah, he, he sort of says from what I can gather from this book is you're going to have more of your rights restricted when you go underneath the government but you're getting some payoff for that so uh, that was i suppose the main core of the book that that's what he was really trying to argue now how does this fit in with leviathans so that is the the title of the book and uh, i'll go here to his description of what a leviathan is because i think this also talks a little bit about the commonwealth and and the sovereign as well which i have yet to mention so the Leviathan uh, is uh, of that gr- the of the of that great Leviathan, or rather, to speak more reverently, of that mortal god to which we owe under the immortal god our peace and defense. And I really want to read this out because I'm going to give you a a dose of what the book is sort of like to read. 
For by this authority given by him by every particular man in the commonwealth, he has the use of so much power and strength conferred on him that by terror thereof he is enabled to conform the wills of them all to peace at home and mutual aid against their enemies abroad. Yes, that is a single sentence. <laughs> and in him consists the essence of the commonwealth. So there's the, the main point, which to, to define it is one person of whose acts a great multitude by mutual covenants one with another have made themselves every one of the every one the author to the end he may use the strength and means of them all as he shall think expedient and for their peace and common defense and then this is the the next part and that he that carries this uh, and he that carries this p- person is called sovereign and said to have sovereign power and everyone besides his subject so the other part of the the Commonwealth, I guess, is you might be thinking, oh, that sort of sounds like a democracy, a, a government, or maybe a republic. And he was saying in this, no, you can have multiple different types and a king can be a commonwealth in himself in essence. So like one person can be the sovereign, the ruler, and they can be the one to make all the decisions. And this is just as just and justified as a democracy and things like that. So he doesn't particularly go too deep into the examination of which governments are better than others. And I think this might link back to the original starting point of when the book was written. It was written during a civil war between a democracy and the king and they were fighting over power. So it was sort of like, eh, he better hedge his bets and say both of them are sort of good in a way. Um, and this also then gives rules in the book for what sovereigns are allowed to do. So, uh, this is, I suppose, more, I feel like more opinion rather than based on rationality because there's just some random stuff that pops up, which I'm not really sure where it popped up and I'll, I'll list some of those a little bit later. Uh, but this is usually due to things like land rights, to the subject's actions, what they're allowed and not allowed to do. These sorts of things where not only are you giving up your rights to, to violence, but you're giving up lots of other rights as well, which you, you could say uh, regards to land and how you're allowed to act, how you're allowed to speak, things like that. So that was the main theme that I took from the book. I'll go now on to my observations and personal takeaways. I only listed one theme and that was because parts three and four are really boring. <laughs> really, they're really hard to get through. And uh I didn't, I didn't particularly read them. I, I did spend a lot of time on this book grinding away, trying to read through it. But from that passage I read out, most of the book is like that. It's written in these just long sentences, you know, just the style of the day. The, the ed- editor, David Johnston, of this particular version, he tried to make it better he added footnotes to you know explanatory things saying this word back then used to mean something a little bit different than a this this than it does in nowadays Uh, so he would add those he would add you know little snippets on the side which show what he's talking about in this particular section but it was just a hard book to read overall and parts three and four in particular uh, dealt with christianity and how christianity mixes with government and there was a lot of scripture there was a lot of citing the bible in there and i just couldn't do it man i just i, I just said no nah, I'm, I'm skipping over these parts I, I literally cannot read these they're they're so hard to read so the part four i got through a little bit more but once again there was a lot of religious talk in there and uh, I, I just didn't find it particularly useful page 102 is is interesting because this is where you will find the famous quote and so I'll, I'll read that out uh, from here. So, do, do, do. in such condition, there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation nor use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death in the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So this is what he was saying, what happens when war happens, basically. So this is when war happens, the the life of a human being is all of these things. It's solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. You know, there are no commodities that may be imported by sea. So this is impacting the the land, the the 
I guess, economy of the country, things like that. There's uh, the, the fruit thereof is uncertain. So there's a lot of risk inherent now. No one's going to invest in the country and things like that. So this is his justification of, of what happens when, when war uh, happens. Um, the funny thing, though, is this book isn't as brutal as what it may seem. And this is referencing what I said right at the very start. Many people like to give that quote and then say Thomas Hobbes believes that human nature is nasty, poor, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. Um, yet from reading the actual book, I didn't particularly think that was the case. You know, this is one sentence in a and it's one sentence, one paragraph in a 567 page book. And I didn't feel overall that his sentiment was this is what humans are. He spends a lot of time talking about peace, worthiness. Uh, He talks about power as well. He he talks about the good and bad things. And I I don't feel that his general precept was that human nature, human individuals uh, are bad. That, That wasn't what I got out of it. I got out of it was, yes, humans on their own, when they're left to their own devices, they're just going to inevitably have conflict i think and i think his argument was what do you do with that conflict when it's left alone when you don't have a government to to mediate it that conflict is going to keep growing and growing and and arising um but i didn't get the feeling that he was saying you know humans are bad this is you know this is humans inherently are, are bad people and bad creatures I really, I just didn't get that feeling from the book. And that is how I have seen this quote used most of times and how I've personally used it in the past without reading the full book and going, oh, you know what? I, I, don't, I don't think that's particularly true. I don't, I don't think that's what he was really driving at there. And whilst it's a very nice quote and it's, you know, pithy and short and it's uh, fun to say, I, I feel like it's somewhat getting incorrectly used. But hey, that's just uh, my personal opinion, observation and takeaway. The other thing uh, that, uh, and, and yeah, so I feel it might have been an attempt to create more order and greater good. So he was sort of examining, and this is talking about the book as a whole, he was examining human nature, he was examining countries, he was, he was examining people, and this book was an attempt to say, this is how we can make the world a slightly better place. And uh, I think that's uh, admirable. I think he, he probably did believe in, in what he was saying and that, this is why we need governments. Then we go on to the other part, which is the sort of random, not cool stuff that was included in the book in how he said governments should behave and the powers that they should have. So uh, with that, here's a couple of things that he was also saying in the book. Uh, it's okay to punish people from outside the government, uh, outside the Commonwealth, i.e. enemies. So if they are not part of the Commonwealth, or if they are not part of your country, you get sort of free reign to do whatever you want with them. There is no, uh, this is back, I guess, before there was, you know, the human rights as a, as a whole were given. So uh, I'm pretty sure they still had slavery back in the 1651. So, you know, he wouldn't have been saying that black people had or Africans had, had, had these rights. No, no, no. Or, um, you know, people from the Orient or things like that. No, no, that's that's not sort of uh, <laughs> what he was driving at back then. And this is, I think, you know, how how good's my history? Not that good. Uh, they were, yeah, sorry, they the the spice trade and things like that were happening well before this time. So they would have known about different people in the world, Africans and Asians and whatnot. So um, that was just one point where he was like, yeah, you know what? You can do with people outside of the government, outside of your commonwealth. You have whatever. You, you, it doesn't really matter. Uh, all is allowed, all is permitted sort of thing. Another, uh, rulers make more mistakes by gra- by not grabbing more powers. So he was saying, if you are the ruler, you're actually making it worse for people by not grabbing more power. That, I think, is <laughs> is probably nowadays not the sentiment. And if you see people grabbing power, you, you should be somewhat distrustful of them because they're probably going to do bad things with that. This might be just... We've had enough instances, enough history, enough uh, knowledge now to look back at all the times people have really grabbed as much power as they as they could, and it just typically hasn't ended super well, especially if it's concentrated in in one individual, like a king and whatnot. 
Another, the sovereign is not subject to his own civil laws, only the divine natural laws. Uh, he doesn't particularly talk about what these natural laws are, at least I couldn't find it in the book. This, I might have skipped over that section in part three. But I found that funny where he was saying, yeah, you know what, if you're the king, you can do whatever you want, essentially. You know, if you uh, set up saying a, a law saying that you can only act own this amount of square acreage per person no that doesn't matter because you're the king so you can do whatever you want so i found that just you know that's just a hypocritical part that human nature really loathes that that unfairness the injustice uh i don't really see how that works nowadays if once again i guess you know people in power they might do this stuff but they're certainly not open about it if they're if they're bending and flaunting the laws the rules that it's not like they can do that nowadays out in the open because i I just don't think there's a tolerance for that anymore you see uh, politicians not following the mandated uh, mask laws or you know injection for the vaccine laws or things like that and people are are pretty intolerant of them being able to do whatever they want just because they're the sovereign or they're in charge and the other one was uh, it's okay to censor free speech imprison people and to be the judge sort of arbitrarily so the sovereign he can say no you're not allowed to talk about that free speech is cut down Uh, he can also appoint, appoint himself as you know judge jury and executioner ah this person he's he's talking bad stuff about me I'll, I'll imprison him. Uh, that's allowed. You know, that's okay. Uh, so once again, this is probably getting into the the bad parts of what he was arguing for. And this is where it's like, okay, yes, Commonwealth seem okay. But if this is what the sovereign, the, the king, the people in power are allowed to do, yeah, maybe, maybe that's not the, for the greater good overall. Maybe that's having more harm on the society and, and the citizens. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, in summary. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I found this a very hard slog book to get through. It's not one where I was enjoying the process of reading. I was definitely forcing myself to sit down and be like, this is a f- philosophical book. I'm going to really try and work my brain here it it felt like homework if you put yourself back in school times that's what it felt like Um, so it was rather unenjoyable there are snippets of interesting passages but it's a book on politics and government and those to be honest just are things that aren't particularly that interesting to me I don't talk about them normally I don't find them fascinating so it was going to be rather unappealing to me no matter what happened Uh, it did fix a, a misconception actually reading the book I think that was useful um, that I had, but it was it was a high price to pay to to fix that misconception of that Thomas Hobbes was sort of anti-human in a way. Uh, that it has changed in my mind, but man, I had to slog through a lot of hours of unpleasant reading to to do that. So overall, I'm giving the book a, a three out of a ten. Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes, not not my favorite, but. Hey, I got through it and it was uh, ticking off sort of a monthly goal, a yearly goal for me. So that was good. So I would love to know what are, what are your thoughts on uh, Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, the, the, the text, the tome, the treatise that it is. It, uh, can you get through it easily? What were your outcomes? Did you feel he was anti-human in a way, uh, you know, deploring human nature as a whole? Was he maybe too lenient on governments? Did you... Yeah, I'd love to know all of these things. So, so leave a comment down below. Once again, if you can subscribe and do those sorts of things, that uh, that helps me, helps the channel. And other than that, I really do hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are in the world. Kyron, out.